not really quite knowing what to talk about right after a workshop yesterday. And yet, the last newsletter was the letter from a friend from Europe, having aroused considerable interest among many people. Also, the last talk I believe we, we had here, responding to a letter from someone concerned with conscience, social conscience, social action arising out of conscience. I thought we could look at a letter which came from this same person. I sent him the tape of the talk in which we responded to his letter on acting out of conscience. And here's his response. No idea yet how we, we're going to tackle this. It's a very complex letter, but we'll, we'll dive right in. Dear Tony, thank you for the consideration you gave the questions I raised in my letter on conscience and attention, and for sending on the tape. Why use this word conscience at all? Especially as you point out, given all the baggage that word carries along with it. Doesn't right action flow from clear seeing, seeing that is without the tint or angle of the self? And isn't that enough? Why posit another hypothetical or at best metaphorical mental mechanism called the conscience, both capitalized, apart from that process? One reason, and I'm not saying that it is a good one, is that we can speak more easily of my conscience, my underlined, than we can of my truth. Conscience, as the word is commonly used, lends itself well to being personalized, custom-fitted, as it were. This is rather handy and helps us avoid a great deal of discomfort. I act in accord with my conscience, in parenthesis, he puts my truth, my reality. And you do the same. And if by chance we meet, wonderful. But if not, well, that's OK, too. People come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Why not a variety of consciences as well? If we insist, however, that there is a truth to the matter, that all is not merely a matter of opinion and personal preferences, that makes things rather more difficult. Especially in discussion or common labor with real people with very real interests vested in this or that version of the truth. And things get only more difficult and potentially divisive as we move from seeing the truth to discerning what our responsibilities are in light of it. History, both ancient and contemporary, provides ample support to the claim that acting in accord with the truth is a very dangerous business. In any society founded on and sustained by well-tended illusions, the truth is quite plainly subversive Jesus lived in such a society, as did Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Franz Jägerstetter, as did Oscar Romero, Stefan Biko or Baiko, and Martin Luther King Jr. Each of them paid in the most precious of coin for seeing clearly and acting on what they saw. This is only too relevant to the question of paying taxes, which has served as well as an example thus far. This question had been in his letter before about paying taxes. In parenthesis, by the way, the percentage of general tax revenues that goes to the military is well over 50%, not the much lower figures you suggested as possibilities. Um, 
just to remark here, I hadn't suggested those as possibilities. I had just read a Newsweek article which pointed out that the health care portion of the federal budget is larger than the military. And that was uh, brought in here. Whether this is true, I don't know. You yourself pointed out in your talk that one of the possible consequences of refusing to pay taxes is that of imprisonment. Then you ask, and what good would that do? I've also been corrected on this by someone who came to see me the next day after the talk and said, there is no imprisonment for not paying taxes. That was one thing that was settled very early in the American whatever. Um, because one had had to go to, to prison for not paying taxes under the old regime of the king, and that was one thing that was a safeguard that uh, debtors would not be imprisoned. But here uh, the question is picked up in a much more general way. I'll repeat, then you ask, and what good would that do? This particular question stood out as I was listening. Not because you pose the issue, issue with any great poignancy. What good could come of my going to jail for the sake of the truth? He makes a possible poignant question. But quite the opposite, because the question passed so quickly, so quietly, so clearly unworthy of serious attention. <clears throat> what good would that do? The unspoken answer rings loud and clear, no good at all. May I suggest that we resurrect and revitalize this question. I'm inclined to think that a great deal rides on how we ask and answer it. What good would it do, Tony, if you were to go to jail for the sake of the truth? As one with an increasing number of friends in or bound for prison for acts of conscience, let us call them acts of truth, he says, I can at least suggest some possibilities. What good it is to go to jail for the sake of truth. One, it would communicate a sense of urgency about matters of common concern to the many people who love and respect you. This sense of urgency is something that comes through quite clearly in many of Krishnamurti's talks. I'm thinking now of those he gave at the time of the Second World War. But how to communicate it, awaken it in dulled minds and calloused hearts. The sense of urgency he's talking about. How to communicate it, awaken it in dulled minds and calloused hearts. Bringing the overwhelming violence and injustice of the powers that be out into the open. Bringing them down on our own head, in fact and offering your, your non-violence and respect for the truth as an alternative could work in this direction with great force. Two, to suffer willingly for the sake of the truth as a mark of rare integrity in a world sick with cynicism. It offers the invaluable gift of hope. Three, it would speak more loudly than words to the claim that meditative inquiry, in quotation marks, is a flattering pseudonym for quietistic escapism. I'll read this again. It would speak more loudly than words to the claim that meditative inquiry is a flattering pseudonym for quietistic escapism. It would counteract that, I think he's saying. It would give healthy pause to those who insist that such pursuits necessitate the most idyllic of settings. It would make clear, as words never could, your position regarding the difference between equanimity and indifference. For it would provide you with an excellent opportunity to share what you have to offer with a class of people who are generally not considered up to such lofty pursuits as meditation. Five, your insights would be challenged, tested, honed on a new and hard stone. 
Not a bad list for starters. One might wonder how, you, how you've resisted the temptation to get, <laughs> to get locked up for so long. One can be locked up in more than one way. Still, I can't help but think that this is the wrong way to approach the whole question. In fact, the question itself is, in a sense, wrong. The question ought not be, what good would it do to go to jail? No one is claiming that going to jail is good, any more than Gandhi's assassination was good. We do not choose these things. What we choose or refuse is to inquire into the truth and to give witness to what we have discovered. In choosing truth, we may have to accept jail or even death, but it is freedom we embrace, not bondage. It is love and life, not terror or murder. This perspective transforms our question from what good is going to jail to what good is the truth? Or to put it a bit differently, what is the truth worth? Is it worth discomfort? Is it worth spoiling your career? Is it worth being reduced to an unproductive member of society? Worth humiliation, abuse, boredom, torture? Worth risking, risking the admiration and support of those who might disagree with you? Is the truth worth suffering, even dying for? As you made clear in your talk on conscience, we live in a complex world the elaborate interdependence of which leaves each one of us bound and sullied by all manner of atrocities. No one's hands are entirely clean. So be it. But the awareness of this fact can serve us either well or ill. It can stir us to do our best or serve to justify our doing nothing at all. I fear that the latter is almost universally the case in this country at this time. We live in a world that is increasingly hungry, homeless, and violent. In such a world, the number one industry is armaments, and the United States is their number one researcher, developer, producer, glamorizer, profiteer. This being a free country, you and I can have whatever opinion we like about the state of affairs, and share it with whoever will listen. All the authorities demand of us is that we respect their right to disagree with us and to act as they see fit, to design weapons of incalculable destructive power, to produce them, sell them, target them, use them. All that is insisted on is our obedience toward the powers. All that is insisted on is our obedience toward the powers, the people, the institutions, the laws, that perpetuate the system, which happens to include financing it. To bow to this insistence is an assault upon the truth itself, the truth of the preciousness of life, of our oneness, of our need for mutual understanding and forgiveness, not mutually assured destruction. The obedience required of us represents disobedience to the truth. The obedience required of us represents disobedience to the truth. We're asked to defer to the big lie, Caesars, Hitlers, Botas, Reagans. In such a context, our question, what is the truth worth, takes on considerable import and urgency. Those of us who claim to take the truth seriously owe one another an answer to it in word and deed. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts with you and welcome your own should you have anything more to say on this matter. Again, thank you for the tape. Should you find all this a bit much to wade through, you have only yourself to blame for having rekindled my interest so effectively. Best wishes to all at Springwater with love.
There are many parts in, in this letter which I put a line on the on the margin which could one could go through and and look at, discuss, comment on. Before maybe going to a more general deep consideration of the whole thing. Because we do get involved, all of us, thinking partially. Partial issues, the power of partial issues has a tremendous fascination to us. It's, it's, it's compelling. And does one over the compellingness of the particular issue, which may seem inclusive but may not be, does one forget or ignore to look at the whole? Looking wholly oneself, looking wholly, meaning not taking any sides, not opposing or bowing to, but just looking. Here in the beginning, the point is made that it is more comfortable or easy to speak of my truth, my conscience and of my truth. Conscience lends itself well to being personalized, custom fitted as it were. One can say, well, this is my conscience and I realize you have your conscience. And this way maybe not at least kill each other over it, but have some tolerance for each other's consciences. We, we pointed out in that talk, the last talk here at this, in this hall, that conscience is a conditioned affair. My conscience is conditioned by the culture, the ideology, the religion, the particular moral values at the particular time that I was growing up, where someone else growing up at a different place, different culture, different ideology, different religion, different values, moral values, has quite a different conscience. Remember in studying anthropology and psychology, how amazed the anthropologists or uh, the team of psychologists and anthropologists were in going into with certain tests, maybe IQ tests, into an, a Hopi Indian community or an Indian community in which individual sticking out is sinful, considered sinful, not, not to be done. And a test is directing itself to individual capacity, capability, intelligence, the intelligence of thought. And how dismally the testing failed. Of course, in the beginning, the conclusion was a sort of a lower IQ reigning here or in, the, in the people. But then uh, in analyzing and thinking about it further, this was come upon that maybe this whole thing of being individually tested to the exclusion of cooperating with others, with a group, was a very negative social value. Frowned upon, not cultivated at all. social conscience of a Russian who's grown up under the communist system may be quite different from the social conscience of a, an American grown up after, under the 
capitalist so-called free enterprise system. The, the Bible, one of the first commandments is do not kill, but it is all right to kill in war and to get the blessings of the church for it. Or to kill someone who has killed. I said, I, to think about that, the absurdity of it. To kill somebody because he has killed, or she. My conscience tells me, someone would say to do away with this person for the sake of the people who are threatened or so. Someone else's conscience says, do not kill under any circumstances. So I think it's, it's pretty clear conscience is a, it, it can, I wouldn't say a personalized thing, it is conditioned. By all the, well, we've got through. <clears throat> Truth Is truth conditioned? If it's conditioned, it is not truth, then it's a conditioned situation. A conditioned way of looking, a conditioned way of responding or reacting. And in a conditioned way of looking or inquiring, according to my conscience, my social values, can the truth be seen? Can one come upon the truth by looking in a conditioned way? That's a question. And then, if for some totally mysterious, unexplainable reason. There is seeing of the truth, which is seeing without conditioning, with the conditioning totally in abeyance, not the conditioning of the organism to keep metabolizing and breathing and, and uh, so forth. Not, we're not talking about that conditioning, but all the psychological conditioning and abeyance, if there is a seeing of the truth, which is seeing without conditioning, that's truth. At that point, it's not my truth or your truth. This is, that is totally absurd. The, the feeling, the sense, the position of my and me and you and yours is absent. It's not there. And therefore, there is a real seeing of what actually is. Not from a vantage point or a disadvantage point, which fragments and clouds and darkens the seeing. So there is no personal truth, my truth, if one says, my truth, then who has it? Whose is it? And is there me and the truth, a duality? We'll, we'll leave this question hanging in there for each one of us to ask over and over again and look in the light of it. And to see how far one can go in thinking it through, and we're thinking has its limitations, its uselessness.
the, this, the statement, if we insist, however, that there is a truth to the matter, that all is not merely a matter of opinion and personal preference, that makes things rather more difficult. I don't think so. I think it makes things very easy, very simple. Where does the difficulty come in? It goes right on, especially in discussing, in discussion or common labor with real people with very real interest vested in this or that version of the truth. And this is where we come to the difficulty. Truth is not something to be, vest, to be invested in. It's not an investment. Who is investing? That's me. Me or my group, my social class or my race, my religion or my government, my industrial complex. But then truth becomes an idea, a concept, to be manipulated for the sake of manipulation, power, acquisition, defense. But that's not the truth. That's, this is not. There's no investing in truth. That is investing in an idea. Do you see that? Truth is the clarity of what is when no investment in me is going on. No attachment to my point of view, whether on a small cellular scale, individual scale, or on a more uh, communal or group or organizational scale. Still me because I become identified with the organization, with the group, and then that's me. And as long as that investment is there, this attachment, identification, as darkness. Not clarity of seeing, which is truth. We're using words here. And please, these words are, are not the actuality. History, both ancient and contemporary, provides ample support to the claim that acting in accord with the truth is a very dangerous business. Let's look, look at this very carefully, at this acting in accordance with the truth. <coughs> See, people's names are mentioned here immediately, Jesus, Bonhoeffer, Jägerstetter, uh, very few people I know of these. I remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany. I think he was involved in the, he was a Christian theologian, involved somehow or other in the plot to kill Hitler. Was that so? Martin Luther King, familiar. It becomes very dangerous when we say these people acted in accordance with the truth. How do we know? Not questioning that there may be, have been, I don't know, yeah, the injustice of the, the, the racial conditions at the time of Martin Luther King, which haven't changed that much since then. But there have been changes that black people can ride on buses, can go to school, can, don't have to go to separate toilets. And the, this, this cause, the, the justification to, to get 
proper laws which make it possible for, for everyone to enjoy equal rights. Hitler, the monumental danger and destructiveness of this individual, all the people supporting him, supported by him. Seeing these things as they are, Hitler, what happened in Germany, what happens to people of a different race in a country where the power is vested in people of another race, different color. To see where does right action comes in, come in? Our training, since time immemorial, has been if something was seen to be wrong, not by everyone, but by some people, something seen to be wrong, to be unjust, dangerous, intolerable, to step in with right action, violent or more recently non-violent marches. At which moment, at which moment in time a position is taken, isn't it? A position of right action against wrong action, opposition. And is that still the seeing? The seeing without any position, any reaction, for or against. And that seeing not just concentrated on the conditions out there in the world, my country or another country, close by or across the ocean, but the seeing, including what is going on in this human being here that is involved in looking and about to take action out of a conditioned conscience. I cannot immediately deny, no, this action wouldn't come out of conscience, this comes out of truth. I have to be so careful and aware, transparent, completely, totally transparent to one's own motives, which compel the action, which motivate the action, to take that under the same intense observation as the conditions that one is about to tackle, attack or change. And I think we human beings throughout the ages have done the one most of the time at the expense of the other or ignoring the other, allowing conscience, thought, to dictate an idea, to dictate action in the presence of injustice uh, or intolerable re regi regime, suppression, power, play, and so forth. Not the, the illumination of the whole field, which includes this here. This here is what, what makes up society. The individual cells make up the whole organism. And if the cell is diseased, hmm, 
not clear, itself beset with violence or desire for exploitation or exerting power, then that is the, the, the stream, the thing continues. No matter what action is taken, no matter what regime is toppled and another put in its place, no matter, no matter what laws are included to give more rights to more people, and prejudice continues if it is not, if it doesn't end in one individual human being. Attachment to self, vested interest in ideas too, not just in money or relationship, but also in ideas. And maybe this is why throughout the ages, no matter how much revolutionary action, social action has gone on, there hasn't been any fundamental radical change. One could point to individual institutions which have become more humanized. One, one can pick out a fragmentary thread and say, here something seems to have evolved. We just said we're not putting people in jail anymore for not paying taxes, not torturing them. In certain kinds, although it always comes out again, there's still this torture, maybe in a small police officer. And Human beings torture each other. But looking globally, a war that ended here is flaring up there. A dictatorship ended here is in full force here, here and there too. Do I have to take action now, immediately, seeing the truth of that? Or can there be a completely different action, which is not according to any idea of right or wrong, but the seeing itself? Intelligence, not of thinking and calculating and planning, but of seeing, the intelligence of seeing. Acting or not acting. Not in the repetitious hold of, I got to do something about this immediately before it's too late. It may already be too late. We don't know. We really don't know. But does action, social, political, economic, psychological, whatever action, does it come, where does it come from? Out of a confused mind? Out of the urgency to act because that is my, what my conscience dictates? Or is there no one there? And just looking and not know what to do about it. I think it's the first step. Because the problem that confronts us, given our human condition of bondage, attachment to the, to the self-system, is monumental, even in the case of one individual human being. And what's our solution to it before we tackle what is made up out of me?
me and you. Because me in me is the same me in you, as the same me in you. Here or in Russia or in South Africa. says, each of them paid the most precious coin for seeing clearly, acting on what they saw. Did the action come with a motive? A motive springing out of the self-system and idea and thought and hope. Hope being also thought. Projected thought. That is something that each one can look at for oneself. What is hope? Not, not speculate about it, philosophize about it. This is not what we're doing here. We're not philosophizing, we're looking. When I say I have, I hope that there won't be a nuclear holocaust. That's thought, isn't it? and scratches a little bit deeper through the surface, honestly, thought is, I don't want to perish in a nuclear hole. I don't want this beautiful earth to which I'm attached to be suffering a nuclear winter, if this is what indeed would happen. I don't want that to happen, and I feel sick at the idea of it. And I hope it won't happen. That hope is not based on seeing, it's based on thinking. If I look at the conditions throughout the world, including myself, my relationship, our relationship with each other, I don't know, how can we tell? can we tell? It's all we can tell right now is, is more and more and more armaments. At the same time, trying to get rid of more and more while building more and more. And where are we going to put what we're going to get rid of? Where are we going to put it? One can drown oneself in a, this fragmentary thread of action to block this nuclear plant or to to support this disarmament. I'm not saying don't support disarmament. But why are we armed? Why are we armed? Why do we defend ourselves? Worldwide and individually. And why do we look for support in our defense of ourselves, which we do? We want allies in our defense of ourselves, in our support, defense, protection. I don't mean of this organism, of this physical being, but of our psychological identity, our image. our mental possessions, our memories, our future hopes and fantasies. We want to defend it and we want support in in that defense, don't we? (coughs) And as long As that is going on, how can we dismantle national defense? Here the person talks about going to jail for not paying taxes, if that may be the case. But why does one, one could say, why make money? Then you don't have to pay taxes. 
don't make anything, you'll have to pay anything. But we, <coughs> we want a little money. And then comes the tax issue. And we want our money protected. Our investments protected, our property, we like to have to think that there are some police around who could maybe apprehend a thief. It doesn't seem to happen so much anymore. But I think we would be willing to pay taxes for the protection of our property. This is, I think, how this whole thing has evolved. Governments becoming stronger to protect a growing class of possessors of property. It's just a question that's occurring. The whole thing of, of going to jail. Incidentally, Krish Krishnamurti is mentioned here as speaking out during the years of the war. Actually, in the years of the war, he didn't speak out very much. He was quite silent. He was in this country. But it was interesting to me to read recently in an Indian, a, a biography written by an Indian woman, that during a period of time where Indira Gandhi had installed very repressive measures in India, putting people in jail who spoke out against the line, the party line or whatever she felt needed to be supported or protected, Krishnamurti inquired very carefully of his friend in India what the conditions were, that he was not going to say anything but what he needed to say, but he wasn't going to say it if he was going to be put in jail. I mean, I think he didn't go to India during part of that time because he was advised not to, that it was not indicated to speak out. It maybe have been apprehension and later because of personal friendship. Indira Gandhi said, well, Krishnamurti can say what he wants. So, a little, <laughs> had a little in there. I'm not saying this to say just because Krishna Murray does is there for all of us. <laughs> what is this thing of what is being spoken to here? The, uh, isn't it sort of to make an example of oneself? To inspire people. Here is one who is really suffering for the truth, willing to suffer for the truth, for what he or she said, take the consequences. And the inspiration of that, just like during the Vietnamese War, it was felt, at least by uh, the Buddhist community, it was very inspiring of Buddhist monks to pour gas over themselves and put themselves alight with fire, burn themselves, emu em emulate. Thinking about it, sort of a shiver goes over down the spine. I cannot help but feel something about that. Violence? Violence against life itself? I don't know. Several people felt this helped to end the Vietnamese war. But the war is still going on. Followed by a much, much bloodier two years in Cambodia. Khmer Rouge. Mass killing. So this thing of making an example 
out of oneself. We've also been conditioned and educated that this is a fine thing to do. One has to watch motive there if one goes to jail. I just read in the Newsweek that a new Palestinian youth is growing up on the West Bank, well-educated. Different thoughts and ideas, uh, having a Palestinian homeland but with democracy, having been in touch now with these ideas and concepts. And yet to be a leader among this new group of Palestinians, one of the credentials is one has to have been in jail to be considered material for a leader. What, what good is inspiration and example? We're questioning it right out, head on. Or, it, it, inspiration is inspiration. It may inspire lots of people to march or to congregate together to make plans for something, or vote. But does it affect seeing? Does it bring about the clarity of insight into the whole of humanity and nature and everything? Or is it again a very narrow, albeit very energized path? from here to there, toward the goal, based on my ideals and ideas of what is right and wrong. With which I'm not saying that if someone says, you have to go to jail for what you said, or if you say this again, you will be put in jail, or say something else which is not true which is not so, and then you will be free, and you will not go to jail. Will one go along with it? I don't know. I think one has to, there's no choice. If something is seen to be so, then one's whole being is witness to that. Isn't it? And in when there is seeing, there is no, no attachment to self and no fear, no fear of the consequences. One will meet the consequences. How? I don't know. Would one stick around to be apprehended or would one leave? Not go to jail so one can continue talking. <coughs> or would one have the idea, if I go to jail, I will inspire hundreds of people or thousands of people. And will one look at what its inspiration is? Is that clear? That inspiration and example is not insight. It may prevent it. Because now one has something to do. Whereas insight is nothing to do. <clears throat> but wondering what is. Undistracted by the, by the energy to do something. the idea and the energy to do something. This whole concept of willing to suffer for the sake of the truth, I think we have to look at that. Is there, again, my suffering for the sake of that truth? Is there a separation? Suffering is suffering. If I suffer, there is suffering. And I want to know why I'm suffering. Is it just the pain? Or the idea I shouldn't have it? There's the I mixed in with that. What I don't want, what I think about and, and compare with, a better state and so forth. But I'm going to suffer for the sake of the truth as a philosophical idea. It's not the immediacy of what is. Because there's no for the sake of the truth. Truth is what is. And that truth, he asks, 
What is that worth? I don't know what that's worth. Maybe nothing. Worth to whom? To me? So I can use it to get some place? Individually or socially? Politically? For the sake of all human beings? Who are all human beings but me? What is the truth? The, the knock, the scratch, the wind, the trees, the, the self-manifesting, the self-dissipating. This instant of, of nowness of what is seen completely, not shadedly or fragmentarily. And there is no for the sake of in that, as that's a thought. And that truth acts, or doesn't act, but not for the sake of something. Does that make sense? the truth, or what does one think the truth is? Two different things. If one could come to what truth is through thinking, more thought based on what was. Which is not what is. What is what is? What is that? I have to come at it completely freshly. With no value judgments, no idea what I'm going to use this for. It's not usable because the next moment if I remember it and think, I can use this and proclaim it, it's gone. It's, be it's become a concept. If the concept is not there, then the present seeing this moment is it. But it's nothing. You could say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're, you're talking. Why are you talking? I really don't know. I'm talking, but here we are. There's a talk scheduled. This letter arrived, and it's a good thing to look at it together. I don't know what'll come of it. Are we doing it for the sake of something, or because here's a, a question, a challenge? one wonders about it. And in that wondering, can there be an ebbing away of all that we know, and therefore a, a fresh in-touchness with all that is? Not knowing what it is, not knowing what good it is, what one will use it for. That's, again, the old conditioning, the old conscience rearing its head. What, what good is this for if you sit there quietly? I don't know. Talking. 
talking about that, that part of the letter. There's so much in here. Yes, is one concerned that people may label one being quietistic, no, do, do nothing people. Mm -mm. One may be labeled that, and this is what we do, we label each other. We get opinions about each other from very little direct contact. Direct contact with someone is doing, one just hears about it, has some distant view of it, and labels it. That, that's what we do, all of us. Unless we become very cautious in these things, because we can see how, how hurtful they are, how encasing and limiting. But does one immediately say, how can I prove to the world that we're not quietistic, do-nothing people, by doing something? Where would that come from? And I'm not suggesting that this is what the person is talking about. And yet, one has to be aware of fear of bad image and wanting to correct it. And then taking the action to, to correct the image rather than out of seeing. It seems uh, one has followed a little bit the history of Zen centers or spiritual groups, maybe due to being blamed for inaction or just contemplation of navel, which has no social usefulness, a lot of centers have become more socially involved, to have a socially active Buddhism. Or, and some of this, it seemed to be a reaction to not wanting that, that's that label of being quietistic, dead void sitting, wanting to prove that we are also interested in society. So one can look, that's the beauty of it, one can always look, where do, do my feelings of discomfort and my feeling of urgency, I should be doing something about, where does it come from? From really seeing something needs to be done, then it's not a problem, then it's not a choice, then it's done. It gets done, or one cannot do it, one sees it's impossible to do it. Or is it out of a reaction to what somebody thinks about me, and wanting to be thought of better. That's very important to look at. <coughs> this also, um, I think, shows up to us how we think. If we are not socially active, meaning pointing to I'm doing this and this and this for society, for or against armament or so, if one cannot give evidence of this, the, then one is thought of or thinks, therefore we're not doing anything. The brain has been conditioned. I don't know whether it's capable to do otherwise, unless it's completely quiet, but it's been conditioned to think in opposites. If it's not socially, social action, it must be quietism, it must be do-nothingness. And we believe what the conditioned brain suggests, being conditioned to think in opposites. We believe then that this is so, rather than question the very categories of thinking. Yesterday, in the workshop, was a young man who was very concerned over not wanting to go along, conform with what was happening in society, not wanting to be involved in striving for a goal, having seen some of the what this all involves, and not wanting to be part of that. 
but then also concerned, am I now a drifter? Does it mean that I'm now drifting? And the question had the quality of, tell me, am I drifting? Is this what I am? Is, am, am, am I justifiably being called that? Because upon questioning further, he said, yes, this is what people in my family or whoever is calling me. And then we're becoming unsure. Is this what we are? Because we're not striving for a goal. Therefore, we must be drifters. So can one free oneself from these categories of thinking? By seeing them. By becoming aware of them and questioning them. Not knowing what label the alternative is to not goal striving, but seeing how what one is doing. Disentangling oneself from the immense power of words and labels and categories. Not only oneself, but each other. <clears throat> If we, if we can accomplish that, we won't have to arm against each other or defend each other because it is always the image that we're defending and arming for or against. could say, wait a minute, you're making an assertion. No, it's not an assertion. Find out. The person who says that may be wrong, but will one look for oneself? What it is that one is defending and looking for support from others in that defense? He seems seem to be, maybe I'm wrong, seems to be another opposite. If one is not fighting or opposing what is called here destructive power, the power to produce, sell, target, use armaments, in this particular case, the question had been about military, the military expenditures and, and, and activities. If one is not actively speaking out against that or working in a movement against that, then one is bowing to this insistence. It says here, to bow to this insistence is an assault upon the truth itself. The truth of the preciousness of life, of our oneness, our need for mutual understanding and forgiveness, not mutually assured destruction. I think we, we touched upon that right at the beginning of this talk. In seeing what goes on, without any illusion, no whitewashing, or no fear either, what is going on in, in armament? Let's take that one fragment. It's a fragment. We have to also look at the total thing. Or look at that totally, with no reservation, no point of view, no plans already in the back of the mind of how to tackle it. And just seeing it. And if, if the monumentalness of this is seen, maybe one doesn't know what to do about it. Or whatever suggests itself, one already can see, well, it'll go so far, but it will bring certain side effects or contradictions or new conflicts, new problems. 
One can see that. We've done, we, one just needs to survey our historical development. Everything we do is also creating a new conflict. One sees it in our environmental efforts. I read a year ago, so something about the grizzly bear. I wanted to remember that because it was such an incredible example of constantly trying to do something for the grizzly bear in around Yellowstone and constantly putting our foot into it, doing, making a mistake which then, I didn't remember it, obviously, but then we had to mop up that effect, and then the grizzly was affected adversely, and when I wanted to do something for the grizzly bear, then it was, it was just endless. And the larger picture being that the normal habitat of the grizzly bear has been taken up by us. Population farming land and so forth, more production, more oil. Where is one going to start and end in looking? Can one stop and just quietly wonder? about this monumental problem of the human self and not know, <clears throat> not know the solution, not grab or pant for action, but let the energy gather in not knowing. Not tense and tight, but open, relaxed, vulnerable, undefended without expectation of reward or result. And with that, maybe getting in touch with I don't know what. could go on and on, but I think we'll end here for today. <clears throat>